right. Uh, yeah, it's been just introduced me. My name is Andrew McCloskey. I work at VLC, and I'm talking about chapters nine and ten from FP in Scala. Uh, so just thought I'd start off with a little quick recap of what we've done so far. So we've gone through part one already. Uh, we had a quick look at what uh, functional programming is. Had a look at some basic data structures like lists and trees. We've done error handling with values, so option and either. Had a look at strict versus lazy evaluation and pure state. Then we moved on to part two. We covered parallel parallelism and property-based testing last month. And tonight I'm finishing off part two with parser combinators. The second half of my talk, I'm covering monoids, uh, which is the first chapter in part three, where we start to look at common structures in functional uh, design. And then next month, we get monad and applicative and traversable functors. After that, we're into part four, which we don't need to worry about tonight. And I just thought I'd start the talk with um, this quote from Dijkstra. It says, the purpose of abstraction is not to be vague, but to create a new semantic level in which one can be absolutely precise. And I thought that was kind of appropriate tonight because we're talking about um, some kind of abstract ideas. So algebraic design in the first, first part of the talk and monoid um, in the second part. And sometimes there's, you know, when we start to talk about these abstract concepts, people can get a little uh, intimidated or think this is kind of purely for theory. But really we are trying to find this sort of new semantic level uh, in which we can work, which kind of helps us uh, work with more precision and, yeah. All right, parsers. So before I dig into what parsers are, um, I'm not actually going to be talking in great depth about how parsers work. Uh, the point of this part of the book is kind of more focused on the design approach, um, and in this case using algebraic design. So if you came here looking for in-depth parsers, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> but if you, if you follow along in the book chapter, you will get that kind of in-depth stuff, and I encourage you to work through it. What is a parser? Uh, in a simple sense, it's something that takes unstructured data and makes it structured. So a simple example would be taking a string, maybe from a CSV file or something, and turning that into a, a sale data type, or some data type that we, we know how it works, we kind of have confidence that it's valid, and our programs can, uh, can use it. And for those who uh, weren't fortunate enough to see Connor at uh, Lambda Jam, he defines a parser as a parser for things is a function from strings to lists of pairs of things and strings. We, well in the book, they don't define parsers quite the same, but uh, yeah, close enough. <laughs> so we're, we're talking about algebra first design tonight, which I think I mentioned. And for the purposes of uh, the talk, we, we talk about an algebra as being some data types, some functions over those data types, and then some laws that specify how those um, functions and types must work together. And when we start getting into how parsers should work, the book kind of lay, lays out some simple uh, design goals. So the first one is that we're going to be using strings as input. You can have parsers that take other types as input, but to keep things simple, we're working with strings. The second one is that we would like to bake in good error values from the beginning. Um, so if you've ever worked with hideous C++ compiler errors, you know how nice it is to have good error values that point you in the right direction. Um, and finally, we're going to build up from some primitive combinators. So, yeah, we start out with our, our small pieces and build on top of those. So, this is a, a candidate primitive. It's about as primitive and simple as it gets for parsers. Um, we're taking one character and we create a parser that uh, takes our input string and tries to parse that character. You'll notice that we're returning a parser of char, we're not actually returning char value. So to get our char value back, we need to run our parser on some input. So we have a run function that takes our, our parser of some type A, takes the input string, and will give us back either a parse error or the value that we are hoping to parse. So at this point, um, as early as possible really, we can start putting this code into some files and actually getting Scala to compile it for us. So we have a compiler, we have static typing, um, and one of the nice benefits we get from these tools is that we can start to compile our things, make sure that our algebra makes sense and then our primitives all fit together. 
And one other thing we, we can start considering from the beginning is our laws. So I mentioned before that an algebra includes laws, and so we'd like to um, identify what those laws are as early as possible and codify them. So in this case, we're using property-based tests from the, the library that we defined earlier in the series. And this is just a, uh, yeah, a simple test that generates a string, pulls the character out, and makes a parser for it, and then runs the parser on that input string. We should get the same character back. So the book um, actually covers higher kindness in chapter 10, but we're kind of dealing with a trait here that has higher kindness, so but we, we tackle it now. Um, before we get into that, just a note on the, the plus symbol and underscore there. So uh, we have a parser and then our um, brackets with the plus and underscore. The underscore is saying that we don't actually care what type we have here. We have a type constructor that takes a, a type parameter, but we don't mind what that type is. And the plus, uh, I think it gets mentioned fairly early on in the series, means that that type is code variant. So if we have some type B that's a subclass of a type A, then if we have a parser of B, that parser B will be a subclass of parser A. So if we're going to get into higher guidedness, we're going to start with looking at what a, a proper type is. So a proper type, uh, at least in this context, is one that classifies values. So we can think of types like string and integer or int as those that classify a value. We can have a value of type int. Uh, something like list on its own is not actually a uh, proper type. We can't have a value to, of type list. We need to know what the elements um, of that list, the type of those elements rather. So a list of int or a list of string. So we say that list is a type constructor. So type constructors are like functions at the, the type level. They take a type argument and then we'll produce a proper type. And now we can talk about kinds. So kinds are sometimes referred to as the types of types. The typed kind captures the type arguments, if any, that are required to produce a proper type. So this might be a little clearer looking at the example. So int has kind star, so it is already a proper type. List has kind star to star, so it's, as you said before, it's a type constructor, which works kind of like a function. It takes a proper type as a type argument, and then returns a, or produces a proper type that we can use to classify our values. Parser's kind is star to star to star. So in parentheses there, our star to star is another type constructor, in this case, in this case, parser. So we can, if we think about our type constructors as being like functions at the type level, and we know that a higher order function is one that takes other functions as arguments, then we can see and um, look at parsers as a higher order type constructor. And another name for that is a higher kinded type. So yeah, when we start to talk about those, that's, that's what they are. And I've, um, I've got a link there to a, a stack overflow post that kind of goes into some more detail about this if you're interested and some links to some reading. Now back to our primitives. So we've got uh, our simple trait, we've got some primitives on there, we're compiling it. Now we can go crazy and just keep adding, adding our primitives as we think of them. So we've got a string, that's pretty primitive. Uh, we want to parse a string, fine. And we have another one that we've added there called or string. So if we have a string, foo, another string, bar, we want either one of those, we don't mind which, then we can use or string. But at this point, we should probably be asking ourselves, is or string really a primitive? And no, it's not really. <laughs> so what we were trying to capture with or string was the idea of alternation. We want some string or some other string. But there's nothing special about strings uh, in that case. We're really just trying to capture the idea of parsing some value or some other value. So it should really work with parsers of any type. So we refined our, our primitive and made it a real primitive, and we have all parameterized on some type A. And just to continue kind of getting an idea of the, the process, we can think of another primitive that we might need, which is a list of things or repetitions. So we might want to parse, say, 10 A characters in a row as one example. And we can write a, another primitive. And this one isn't a trick. This one, this one is a primitive. <laughs> and 
said, we've, we've seen some primitives. We've got a flavor for the process here. Um, we can keep adding combinators. We keep refining them. And there's some questions that we can ask while we go through that process. We can ask if, uh, if our primitive should work for other types. So we saw or string. Um, it it wasn't, uh, didn't need to be limited to just the string type. So we could make that uh, a better primitive to work with other types. We also looked at the properties. Um, so when you come up with a, prop, uh, a primitive, you can ask what properties or laws you expect that to hold, and then codify those in your, your property-based test. So this is really nice that as you're going through this design process, you can build up a, a test suite to test your implementation, which is really handy. Um, I wasn't disciplined enough to do that as I worked through the book, but I was still <laughs> able to come back and kind of add the test later to help diagnose problems. But it, it is easier if you stay disciplined and do it up front. And finally, you can ask about the semantics of a combinator. So we didn't look at a, a, a full example of this, but it's kind of a teaser for the book. You can start to look at things like um, our OR parser and ask whether our OR should be commutative. So if we say we want the string foo or bar, is that the same as saying we want the string bar or foo? Swap the order of the arguments. So these are all yeah, the questions you can ask yourself while you're working through this. So we started to flesh out our algebra, but there's more primitives to be found. Um, and we're leaving that as an exercise for the reader. So I got a lot of uh, value working through the exercise in the book and thinking about these problems. Um, so as I said up front, I don't want to take that away from you. Uh, one thing to note, we don't have any implementation for our parser or parse error types. Um, and it's kind of important to point that out because it's nice to just work with the algebra for now. We're not uh, limited by our implementation. We're not fixated on a particular implementation. And by fleshing out our algebra first before we have an implementation, we can focus on that um, and find out exactly what information we end up needing for our implementation, which has some benefits. It gives us a smaller surface area for the people who use our library. They have less to think about, hopefully. And also, when we come to implementing it, our implementation is restricted. There are fewer possible implementations um, for our algebra um, once we know everything that it has to do. And finally, we look at uh, context-sensitive grammars. So uh, a context-sensitive grammar is one where, or well, a parser at least, is one where some input dictates how subsequent input is passed. So it's probably easiest to see this from the examples. Uh, we have the number one followed by one A character, number two followed by two Bs, and so on. So you can see that the, the integer at the beginning of the string is specifying how many repetitions of some character we should see afterwards. And if we want to introduce context sensitivity into our parsers, we can use our good friend FlatMap, um, which we've seen pop up for a number of types now. And I suspect we'll see, see more of them in the future. Um, so, yeah, you can see how we have our, our parser A there. So in our example, the A value would be the integer that we're parsing. We have a function from A to a parser of B. So that's taking our integer and turning that into a parser for strings to parse the, the correct number of repetitions. And yeah, we get our new parser back. So at this point, uh, once we've fleshed out our algebra, we can move on to um, defining or implementing our JSON parser. And we build this on top of our Parser Combinator library. But again, another exercise for the reader. Um, they kind of just <laughs> leave you with your uh, algebra for the, the Parser Combinator library and let you have at it. <laughs> again, it's another uh, a fun exercise. I spent, spent some time banging my head against that one. And also a note on that, don't, don't be too disheartened if you find it uh, really difficult to kind of make progress. Sometimes it's, you can just kind of peek ahead a little bit if you're really stuck and get some ideas of um, how things can move along. Uh, so in summary, we've looked at algebraic design and uh, looked at some benefits of it. So we've removed the distraction of our implementation details. Um, and that's something that I've definitely struggled with before in my own um, projects, is kind of getting fixated on implementation and losing sight of what exactly my, my library or code should be doing. Uh, we've seen that we can use our compiler as a sanity check. So with the, without having our implementations, we can still make use of our tools um, and make sure that our, our types check and that our, um, our primitives all fit together nicely. Uh, we've looked at using laws and properties 
and in property-based tests, they do is useful checks for our, our implementation. And as I said before, that I've definitely found it um, challenging, including in this chapter, working purely in abstracts. Um, it's not something that I think I'm especially good at, but I definitely could, can, you know, can see and have felt the benefit as well as working through the chapter. So um, yeah, once again, recommend that you, you have a crack. Part three. So I just thought I'd give a little uh, intro on kind of the part rather than just monos to start with. So we've developed a number of libraries um, up until this point in the book, and now part three focuses on abstracting some of those patterns that we've seen in those earlier libraries. And tonight, as I said, we're starting with Monoage, and they also sneak um, foldable in there as well. Uh, so yeah, I think when we start talking about things like Monoids, um, depending on your background, they may have kind of strange sounding names and maybe be intimidating, or you might think that they're you know, uh, purely theory and of not much practical use. But Hopefully I can convince you tonight, I uh, think the, the book also does a good job convincing you that these things have some real world practical value. It's useful to know these things. So for, for starters, they, um, we can use them to avoid duplicated code. If you have common patterns um, and functions that work with those common patterns, it saves you having to go and write them for every type that you want to work with. Uh, they lower the cognitive load that we have to face when we're um, programming. So if we have a well-known abstraction, we don't have to think uh, so hard about how it might work and how to define it. It's kind of laid out for us. We've seen it before. It gives us a common language to talk about uh, talk about these things. So if I'm talking to my colleagues about, you know, I have a monoid in my program, which Nick has said to me many times, <laughs> um, I, I at least have some idea what he's talking about. Um, and finally, the, some of these ideas come from mathematics. And so again, it might seem a little abstract, but mathematicians have a lot of great ideas. They have a, a big body of work, a, a lot of, you know, decades of history working through these ideas, and we can leverage those in our, in our code. So monoids. Instead, we're starting with them. They're simple, ubiquitous. Um, I imagine that for anybody in the room, assuming you've done some programming, you've, you've used something that is um, monoidal or like a monoid, even if you didn't know the name. Uh, we'll see that they're useful in parallelization and that we can compose them, um, compose some simple pieces, simple monoids, and build more complex um, calculations from them. So start with some, some examples. All of these expressions kind of highlight the pattern or show off how um, monoids work. Um, so we've got some string concatenation, uh, integer multiplication, and Boolean ands and ors. And just from looking at the, the structure of the code here, you'll see that you know, there's kind of a pattern running. So the things that they have in common, um, at least the things that are relevant to uh, monoids, is that each of them has a binary associative operation, and each of them has an identity element. So a binary, associ well, a binary operation to start with is an operation that takes uh, two arguments. And an associative operation is one where if we have a, a series of these operations to perform, we can move the parentheses around and um, it won't change the result. So maybe to make it clear, we could start adding parentheses around our integer example um, and say we're going to do the 1 multiplied by the 2 first, and then we'll multiply that result by 3, that result by 4, and so on. And that's, we'll get exactly the same result as if we do it the other way around and start with 3 by 4 and multiply that by 2 and so on. And yeah, the other thing they have in common is the identity element. So the identity is specific to the operation and the type that we're working with, but it's a special value that when combined with any other value of that type using our operation, we'll get the exact same value back. So again, looking at our examples, uh, we'll look at string concatenation, uh, we've got the empty string on the end there. So anytime we concatenate the empty string to another string, we get that other string back. It's, it remains unchanged. So we've, we've uh, defined the two things that make a monoid, our binary associative operation and our identity. And now we're just going to put them in a scala tray. So there it is. Um, and we've also got an example of our string concatenation monoid that um, creates a new instance of that monoid trait. 
Now, the other thing that is really important with monads is their laws. Uh, so you'll notice, I think it's, yeah. So if we look at our um, monad code, we'll see that we have, we definitely have a binary operation. It takes two arguments, but there's nothing there that enforces the associativity. And that associativity is really important because if we're writing code and we expect things to be associative and they're not, then we're going to have a bad time. Our program's not going to work the way we expected. So we uh, define some laws to make sure that everything works the way we want it to. So associativity, as I said, we can move our parentheses around. We should have the same result. And we also have left and right identity laws. So we can perform our operation with the identity as either the first or the second argument, and we'll still always get the same result back. And we can also lean on our property-based testing here and write some laws. So I think in the book, they get you to do this, and it's a good exercise. So anytime you're writing a monoid, you can um, check it against these laws using a, a property-based test. So folds, folds and monoids, they have a, um, a nice relationship. Uh, so if you look at the type signatures for uh, left and right folds, you'll see they take uh, an element of some type B and a binary operation. Now, the binary operation takes um, two values of two different types, but there's nothing stopping us from making them the same type. So if everything's the same type, we now have essentially things that will fit the type signature for our identity element and our binary associative operation. So it looks like a monoid is a pretty good fit, at least at the type level, for um, our folds. Not only that, but because we have these laws that guarantee how the monoid operation will work, we can use fold left or fold right um, with our monoid operation identity, and we'll always get the same result. Um, if you remember back to our fold left and fold right, but one of the differences is that the fold left will associate from the left, fold right associates from the right. Um, and so we've got, uh, we can define a concatenate function, which kind of wraps this up nicely for us. So it will take uh, a list and then a monoid, and then use the monoid operation and identity to do the fold for us. Now, we also have a fold map. So implementing this is left as a homework exercise, so I won't ruin it for you. But if we have a list of uh, values of type A, but we have a monoid for some other type B, if we have a function that will take us from an A to that B, then we can use that function to get a list of Bs and then use our monoid to fold over them. Uh, and even better than that, we can actually do that in one pass of the list if we, um, if we implement our fold map correctly. Parallelism. So uh, we've just seen how we can uh, fold from the left to the right with our monoid and we get the same result. We can also do a balance fold. So we can split our, our workload, our list of operations in half and deal with kind of half of our list on one side, half on the other. And this has some, some nice benefits. So if we look here at the, the simple case of a fold, we're just taking one element at a time and concatenating them to a list. And this has one problem in that it is actually quadratic, um, which isn't great. So we're just concatenating a group of strings. You wouldn't think that that needs to be quadratic, and it doesn't. If we use our balance structure, we um, we avoid making it quadratic, and we can basically get a tree of our work. We can keep splitting our um, our arguments up, and then we get kind of a tree that has height of log n, and then we concatenate up. So I think it should be n log n, not quadratic. Not only that, um, if if we split up our work like this, it also becomes amenable to parallelization. So we can ship off half of our workload to some other computer, half to another, and then combine the results at the end. So, modern homomorphisms. Uh, the book kind of has a little side panel about these. They don't delve into too much detail, so don't stress if this isn't all clear to you now. But uh, we'll start with an example. So length is a monoid homomorphism between the string concatenation monoid and the integer addition monoid. So what this means is that we can take, uh, in the first example, our string monoid, and we can combine our two strings, go and bar, and then take their length. The ultimate goal is we want to get the length of um, these strings concatenated. But 
as we saw before, if we were, had a naive implementation of our fault here, then this could um, this could be quite slow. It might be quadratic, for example, to concatenate all the strings and then state their length at the end. Um, however, we can get exactly the same result if we take the length of each component string um, first and then use our integer addition monoid to uh, follow over them and get the results, which is really nice. And uh, this also fits into our format function that we looked at before. So you see our um, homomorphism fits there as the, the mapping function, and then we can get all over our list with our integer addition monoid. And again, this will do it in one pass if you implemented it correctly. So compared to the naive implementation, we've um, yeah, we've saved the pass over the list and we've avoided a quadratic operation. It's nice. And following on from that, we have monoid isomorphisms. So if we have two homomorphisms between types, so our functions f and g, f is uh, from type a to b, and g is a function from b to a, um, and then if the uh, composition of f and g is the identity function, and so is the composition of g and f, then we can form a monoid isomorphism. So an example here is a concatenation for strings and for list of characters. So yeah, we can go from a list of characters to a string, concatenate them, and then go back to the same, go back to a list of characters, and that's um, the same result. So this is yeah the point in the book where they slip in foldable. So we've been talking about how folds fit with monoids nicely. So we can actually capture that um, that pattern as a foldable. So you'll notice before we were talking about um, we had our folds specified as taking lists of things. Here we're just taking f of a. So you'll see again we have a, a type constructor f. We don't care what um, type that contains, and we don't actually worry about what the type constructor is specifically. So now. Um, we can implement this for trees and for lists and then have functions that take advantage of our, our folds without worrying whether we're dealing with trees, lists, or some other data type that we can fold over, which is, which is nice. Composing monoids. Um, so yeah, monoid instances on their own maybe aren't, aren't that exciting. We're kind of codifying a pattern that we're all probably somewhat familiar with already. But uh, we can compose them, and that allows us to do even more interesting things with them. So uh, one of the first things we can do is this product monoid. We can take a monoid for type A and another one for type B, and return a monoid for a tuple of A and B. So yeah, this is another exercise for the reader, but hopefully not, not too stretching, not too hard to see how it might work. And then the book also gives us this example, which is probably a little more exciting, which is a map merge monoid. So given a monoid for some type V, where that uh, type is the value type in a map, we can produce a monoid that will merge two maps, or merge the, vol the values into maps. So an example might uh, yeah, make that a little clearer. So here we're actually uh, merging a nested map of string to string to int, and we create our um, our new map merging monoid top there. So we're using integer addition to merge the values of the inner map, and then we can use another um, use a map mer merge monoid uh, function again to create another monoid that will merge those inner maps. Um, so yeah, we create uh, one map M1, another one M2. You'll notice they both have a common path. Uh, through the keys, so the top one has got 01 I2 and so does map 2, uh, the values there being 2 and 3, and so yeah, we can use our new monoid and merge these two maps. And yeah, the outputs there at the bottom, you see we get the result 5. Pretty cool. Um, we can also compose our monoid instances to perform multiple calculations in one pass, so we can fuse our traversals over some structure. So yeah, again, we're kind of motivating this with an example. If we would like to get the mean of a list of integers, we need two things from that. We need the, the length of the, the list, how many elements do we have, and we also need the sum. So the naive implementation of this might, uh, might say that you would do one pass and you count the number, and then the second pass and you'd sum them all up. But we can use our product monoid and be a little bit uh, more efficient. So in both cases, or 
both sides of the, the tuple, we'd like to add our values. And the operation we're going to use is the um, is fold map. So we can fold map and we can turn our uh, our values from the list into tuples. So it's a tuple of the, the constant one and then whatever the value in the list was. So now if we add up the values in uh, all of these tuples, we'll get the uh, number of items in the list or the count in the left side of the tuple, and the second element will have the sum. And we get that out in one pass of the list. So now we can take our, our count and our sum, divide one by the other, and we get our mean in one pass. So that's it for monoids. Um, we've seen that we've got some attractions for common patterns. Um, they've got some, some benefits that are, are real world benefits that we can use in our programs. Uh, I probably didn't stress it enough in the talk, but obey the laws. Uh, we need those laws to you know, protect us and make sure that our, our programs do what, do what we think they're going to do. Uh, and yeah, we looked at some examples of how monoids are particularly good for parallel computation and fusing traversals to make things more efficient. And that's it.